So I'm going to talk about stress injuries, particularly of the lower extremity and patellofemoral pain syndrome. I think what we have to think about when we're looking at the etiology of these various syndromes or injuries is that they may be sport specific as well. There are certain issues we have to look at that certain sports lend themselves to. So what we call extrinsic factors, looking at what are the training surfaces that these individuals are playing on or perhaps doing their competition on in situations like gymnastics. The shoes, are they appropriate, excuse me, not only for the individual, but for the sport. What about the equipment that's being used? Is that also the appropriate size for the individual as, as well as the appropriate protection? Too many times you'll see there's hand downs or well, they may just get something that's less expensive to do the trick and may not necessarily do the actual function for them. What about environmental conditions? And I think that's important to consider, particularly with changes in temperature. Soccer, sometimes there won't be games that are going on. Football, however, continues. And we have to look at what the weather temperature is. Is it too humid? Are they tiring because of that? And also altitude situations with many of the traveling teams that are out there now. What about intrinsic factors? And we look at this situation called biomechanical malalignment or otherwise known as miserable malalignment syndrome. The patient's miserable and there's malalignment that we pick up. And I'll get to that in just a second to further explain that. Is there a leg length discrepancy? And that's a big issue. Um, it's a small amount. It doesn't have to be more than eight millimeters, but sometimes that can translate itself into other factors. Muscle imbalance, muscle weakness, are they equal on both sides in terms of the lower extremity? We look at agonist muscles and antagonist, the hamstring, the quadriceps, and what about flexibility? It's not just stretching before you do the activity, it's maintaining flexibility over time. We look at the lower extremity mechanics, as I'm talking about now, as we'll work our way up the lower limb. I would like to just go to the hip for a second and look at the angle that we're looking at created from the hip area down to the knee. And we look at these little angles that we're talking about here called Q angles. We don't commonly measure it, but certainly we can see by the angulation, with females tending to have wider pelvises and greater genuvalgum than males, we can see that there may be more excursion of the kneecap with that, hence the malalignment. And what's going on further down in the foot? Is there pronation, is the person falling in, or supination in terms of rolling out on the outside of the foot? It's all connected, as I always say to the patient. The shin bone's connected to the knee bone and the knee to the hip, and it's so true. So let's look at some of this muscle imbalance in action. So let's look at this in motion, and hopefully it should start. Oh, let's try here. There we go. So look at this in motion as we're, we're going through. Look at this individual. This is a patient who presented to me with bilateral knee pain. And so we decided to get her on the treadmill, and you can see why she's probably having some discomfort. And this is certainly in terms of her biomechanics. Do we tell her don't run? <coughs> no, I think we have to work with her on this and see how we can help her out. But certainly you can see going from the knee and then what's tracking down following her foot, how she pronates, see how she falls in there. And then trying to help her out with all these mechanics. And look at her knee muscles as far as what we're looking at in the quadriceps area. So let's look at that now as we took a look at her feet and then working up to the shin. And we're looking at what are the stresses onto the shin itself. We look at medial tibial stress syndrome, referring to pain that a lot of these youngsters will complain of, adults as well, but let's just deal with the adolescence right now on the medial aspect of the lower leg. And the muscles involved there, looking at primarily the tibialis posterior, the anterior, and the muscles on the lateral aspect of the foot, the perineal muscles. And what happens if they continue on, and that's when we look at the stress fractures. The common type of shin pain occurring in females more than males tends to be the tibial stress syndrome. The causes, as we've alluded to in terms of some of the intrinsic and extrinsic factors, are the overuse training errors, errors, the repetitive traction of the muscles involved in the lower extremity, and is there enough flexibility there? And what happens is it's this continuum that the muscles fatigue and you get a periostitis. That can no longer hold up in terms of the activity and you end up with fatigue of the bone and then a stress factor occurs when the periosteal resorption in response to this periostitis outpaces the lamellar bone formation. So what I usually tell the patient and so they can kind of grasp, well they don't see anything on an x-ray and they think, well I'm okay, you know it hurts but I can, I can tough it out. Well I, the analogy I use is if you had a piece of metal 
or a credit card that you want to break in two and you keep bending back and forth and you get sort of this stress reaction, the squiggly lines, and then boom, you get the two pieces and you certainly don't want the two pieces. And we often will then go to MRI examination. There's a lot of local tenderness. And you see on MRI examination the increased signal in terms of where the arrow is by the bone marrow signifying a stress fracture. There's a, the continuum, what's a stress reaction versus a stress fracture. And certainly you use your clinical diagnosis as well. We tend to use more in terms of MRI examination to look at the soft tissue. And of course, there's no radiation involved as opposed to going with bone scan. And if someone presents with bilateral shin pain, I usually do the MRI of the more symptomatic one because, you know, if that doesn't show anything, it's unlikely that the less symptomatic one will. Do we follow up with x-rays? Not usually unless there is some reason that the individual is not improving. This is a case of a young rower, a male rower who was doing some land training, doing a lot of stairs, running. He had a leg length discrepancy that was significant. I believe his was nine millimeters. He did have a fair amount of pronation, not as bad as our runner in the video, but he did. And he actually had lateral leg pain. This was his initial x-ray in March and, oops, in March, and he did not have anything that showed on x-ray. However, MRI was positive in this case, and it did show a fracture line. He was followed, did very well, and then was asymptomatic, and then presented with complaint of some lateral shin pain. So of course, we wanted to make sure nothing else was going on, and we repeated the x-ray, and you can see that there's some nice callus formation. He actually had a perineal tendonitis and did quite well he was actually prescribed some orthotics to modify his motion as well and some strengthening exercises. I use this opportunity just to once again reiterate the importance of what Alicia had referred to in the female athlete triad as we've come to know this syndrome basically I think since the 1990s. When someone is a particularly a female of course because we're talking about in terms of <coughs> menstrual cycles presents with stress fracture particularly if there's recurrent stress fractures the red lights and red flags should go on and is there an any disordered eating or what we've now come to term low energy availability. Are they feeding the machine properly to put out what they need? Are there any menstrual dysfunction abnormalities? Doesn't necessarily mean that they've never had a period or amenorrhea, but have they a regular period? What's happening there? Is that being influenced? And what about skeletal problems, any osteoporosis or osteopenia? Because at this stage, they can still lay down new bone. So I just put that out there as it's important for us to remember. When we're looking at treatment for these two type of conditions in the lower limb, as far as the shin is concerned, usually athletes with tibial stress syndrome can continue to train, but at decreased level and decreased impact. So perhaps if there's some mild tibial stress syndrome that we will put them at rest from impact activities for two weeks, but con to continue modified cardiovascular fitness in the sense of non-impact, such as the bicycle, swimming, pool running with a flotation device works well stretching and strengthening of the involved muscles, and certainly that's when physical therapy comes into play, and orthotics, if indicated, to modify the motion in the feet. For a stress fracture, an impact-free period of six to eight weeks, despite the fact that the parents and the children will usually try to negotiate with you, but I can only say the bone has its own agenda and talk to them in terms of possible repercussions if they decide to continue on, but usually the pain stops them. I usually uh, have the individual placed in either a pneumatic walker boot. It's usually easier to get around school and they feel comfortable with it. Some of them it's the in thing. Um, as well as, or uh, a tib fib cast that goes up to the upper part of the lower leg, but they can still bend their, their knee. And they usually find that quite comfortable as well. Once again, it's an opportunity for us to address the nutrition, their hormonal, and what is going on with their bone density. Going further up the lower leg to the knee, looking at some of the overuse things, I think one of the most common things we see is patellofemoral pain syndrome, and that's really the articulation of the patella with the femur. But bear in mind, looking at the quadriceps muscle here, the VMO muscle, it is of utmost importance in terms of patellar tracking, which is often a problem, as we saw in that motion video. It's the most common type of knee pain in adolescents, girls more than boys, sometimes related, of course, to the mechanics that I was looking at. Once again, we're looking at the tight hamstrings. What is, if there any rapid growth that's taking place? What about the ratio between the quadriceps and the hamstrings? Usually it's a 60-40 ratio in terms of what we're looking at the strength. And once again, I hate to hammer this home, but it does come into play when we're looking at the overuse injuries is the biomechanical alignment. On a regular basis, just walking around may not be of an issue, but 
these forces are magnified 800 times perhaps when they're doing an activity, repetitive activity, as a lot of these young individuals are doing. So when we look at patellofemoral pain syndrome, we'll ask the individual, where's your pain? And we often get what this is, a grab sign, just well in the front of my knee, and they often can't really locate it. They may describe a positive theater sign, which means not because they live near New York City, um, but because they are city for a while, and then when they go to get up, they complain of discomfort in their knees. There's rarely any swelling. There may be some medial tenderness, one, because there is some internal torsion of the lower extremity, and there may be some patellar maltracking, as we've come to see. So here's the VMO, or lack of it, in this young individual. And then here is an Olympic cyclist who you can see how his VMO is quite well developed. Uh, we're not looking for that, maybe somewhere in between, like his friend has. But there we go from there. In terms of treatment, what we're looking at, once again, stretching, strengthening exercises, looking at that balance. With PFPS, we often try maybe taping the patella to see if there's a tracking issue, and does that help? Maybe that will be a sign that it may be worthwhile to either get a certain type of motion control shoe or to put some type of insert in their shoe. Modifying the activity, perhaps they're doing a lot of jumping, lunging, squatting, and we want to try and back that off for a bit, but still maintain their fitness as we're strengthening their muscles. Pain management with either topical or oral anti-inflammatories is indicated, provided there's no contraindication, and only for short periods. I don't think that we should have adolescents going out there to play their sport having to pop an Advil just to get through the game. Many times that comes up in the course of the encounter in the office itself. Like, well, no, I've been okay. I've been taking Advil. So I think we have to look at that. And orthotics where indicated. And you can see in these shoes, they usually have athletes bring in their shoes, and the staff are really great in terms of telling them. However, sometimes they're bringing in their shoes for arm problems, but at least they're bringing their shoes when I need them. And so you can see here, when I look at the back of the shoe, everyone will say that they tend to roll on the outside. Well, what happens, whatever goes in has to go out. And when you look here, if you look at this shoe, you can see if you take a point from midpoint here to midpoint of the heel, how there's an angle there. It leans in. This case was actually a little bit more on the right than the left when you actually saw it. And this person actually had a leg length discrepancy with the right leg being longer. Hence, it was falling in more every time they were making contact with the ground. Orthotic devices, there's many of them out there. I don't think they work for everybody. Uh, I don't think all of them work for everybody. And it's important to see what worked for someone in the past if they want to go with that or what didn't work. And it's basically used in both cases of a pronated foot, as we see up here, as well as supinated, someone going on the outside of their feet. Varying degrees are uh, prescribed for this, and it's, it is a bit of an art in our science of medicine. So let's look at some of what we call osteochondrosis, which is specific to the <coughs> adolescent age group, and we're looking at the pediatric age group. This is a traction apophysitis of the tibial tubercle, and it's caused by the repetitive trauma to the anterior knee, usually by overuse activities, a lot of activity during the time of the growth spurt. Boys usually ages 10 to 15 years, and girls a little sooner, um, ages 8 to 13 years, and these are rough estimates. Usually they complain of anterior knee pain. There may be some swelling over the tibial tubercle. It's usually it's aggravated by the activity, subsides. After they've stopped over the next day or two, they're okay. But of course we know oftentimes they'll get back and do something else. And there may or may not be some bruising that I've seen on some occasions, kids that have continued on through, and perhaps they've caused a little bit more traction on that area. 80% are unilateral, but certainly you get the cases that can be bilateral. X-ray, unless you're concerned that something else is going on, is often not indicated, but certainly in cases that you can see that they may have, in terms of looking at the tibial tubercle, sometimes there may be a little bit of fragmentation in that area as well. And this is usually self-limiting uh, in terms of the activity, you modify the activity, but also as far as growth is concerned when that apophysis is fused. Treatment is, as I'd mentioned, the rest of the modified activities, ice massage, of course, anti-inflammatories as indicated, and infrapatellar strap. There's various ones out there, and the idea is similar to what we'll do with a tennis elbow to stop the vibratory sensation going to the most symptomatic area. And usually the individual will try it in the office and just watch how they're placing it, and they'll say, oh yeah, that feels better. And uh, usually they're then more likely to use it. Certainly, once again, looking at the strengthening and proper stretching, but not just before the activity on a regular basis, and the biomechanics assessment, because that can lend itself to it as well.
There is another type of apophysitis that occurs, and not to forget about it, in the anterior aspect of the knee, less common, but still out there, called syndig larsen johansson disease. And by and large, these are called diseases, but they are conditions, and it, I think that's important to explain to the patient. And this usually occurs, well, not usually, it, it will it be at the distal pole of the patella, and it occurs about age 10 to 13 years in, in both male and females. And there's swelling and pain at the inferior pole of the patella. And the treatment is similar to that of Osgood Schlatter's. However, sometimes I've found that some individuals prefer a neoprene knee sleeve with a patellar opening as opposed to the infrapatellar strap. So you see which works best for them. Some of them prefer uh, the strap also because it's less bulky. So we look at the injury prevention guidelines. I think a lot of the uh, situations on the left have been talked about in the slides just before. And I think what I'd like to stress though is the adequate recovery. And to let these individuals, both the parents and the children know, that not to play when tired or in pain and to vary the sports. I think too often now people are on track for one sport and it's not just what they're playing in school. They're doing the travel team, they're on the development team and I think we really have to get back the message that we need to vary the sports, so not having the muscles contract the same way all the time. And I think it's also good for the psyche, looking at the psychology of it, and making sure that our adolescents and young athletes are prepared as far as nutrition and hydration. And our job, not the media, not the television, is to take time to discuss and educate both the parents, the children, and the coaches. Thank you.